Hello, you're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. To recap for those who didn't listen to episode 0, this is a podcast looking to cover the period of 323 to 30 BC. After reading the title of this episode, you might be asking, why the Age of Alexander? Well, in order to understand the Hellenistic Age, you need to look at the career of Alexander the Great, whose rather short life of only 33 years sets up the framework for the next 300. In order to understand Alexander, I thought it would be best to give the background of the major players and condense some important historical events to give context to his rise onto the world stage. I'm going to be looking at the key groups of the Greeks, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, and lastly, the Kingdom of Macedonia. I am also not going to go into excessive detail into each, given that the histories of Persia and the Greeks alone could make podcast series unto themselves. But I wanted to give a very rough outline of the major players that will continue to shape the world both during and after Alexander's reign. So, sit back, enjoy our first episode, The Ancient Greeks. Few, if any, cultures, perhaps besides ancient Rome, have been as influential to the development of the idea of Western civilization as the ancient Greeks. Their contributions of philosophy, science, mythology, literature, and art have formed the backbone of cultural and intellectual traditions for millennia. In many ways, the Greeks have been used as a stand-in as the defenders of the West and bringers of democracy to an uncivilized world. What's important to understand, however, is that a unified ancient Greece is largely a modern notion. The Greeks had never been under the banner of one political entity, nor were they limited to the modern borders of the peninsula. They, in fact, had spread colonies from the coast of Asia Minor, modern Turkey, to Italy, France, and even some parts of Spain. So, if there is no unified Greece, then how did the Greeks view themselves? To distinguish themselves for their Greekness, the term they used was Hellene, which was used to refer to those who used Dorian or Ionic Greek as a language. Those who did not were classified as Barbaros, or Barbarians. Apparently, their languages sound like garbled bar-bar to the Greek ear. More importantly, however, a very important designation of being a non-Greek implied that they did not live under a rule of law, known as a polis, or city-state. The city-state formed the center of Greek life, the center of their cultural, religious, political, and warfare traditions. From democratic Athens to oligarchical Sparta, this was the way Greeks ultimately established their identities amongst each other. For our convenience, ancient Greece's history begins around the 8th century BC, with the earliest confirmable date being the first Olympic Games, dedicated in 776. For the next 300 years or so, the Greeks remained relatively self-contained, content with engaging in minor squabbles between city-states while developing the political and cultural institutions that would dominate in the later centuries. That is, until they came into a collision course with a power in the East. In roughly 512 to 510 BC, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, under the reign of Darius I, conquered parts of Asia Minor and Thrace. The Greeks, along Asia Minor, known as the Ionian Greeks, incited the rebellion with the help of Athens, who felt a kinship with their relatives in the colonies. The revolt was largely unsuccessful, but it had attracted the ire of Darius, who planned an invasion of Greece in 492 in order to subjugate the Balkans and punish the unruly Greeks for assisting the Ionians. Darius was largely successful, until a decisive battle took place in the Bay of Marathon, where a contingent of Athenian and Plataean hoplites managed to defeat the Persian fleet who attempted to land at the beach, ultimately forcing Darius to return back to Asia Minor. The victory at Marathon would delay the plans of further invasions until the death of Darius, whereupon his son, Xerxes I, would lead off what his father started. This second invasion in 480, much larger than the first, managed to inflict heavy losses on the Greeks. Despite the sacrifice of the Spartans and Thebans at the Battle of Thermopylae, Athens was captured and ordered to be burned to the ground by Xerxes. The tide turned later in the year, when an alliance of several city-states headed by the Athenian commander Themistocles managed to crush the Persian fleet in the naval battle of Salamis. In August of 479, the Greek alliance again inflicted two dramatic defeats on the Persians at Plataea and Mycale, ultimately ending the second invasion. Persia would continue to undermine the Greeks through payments and subdivisions for the next century, but never again would a Persian invasion in the peninsula ever be attempted. This did not end the immediate hostilities between the two groups, however. Many city-states wanted to take the fight to Persian territory in revenge for the apparent sacrilege inflicted by the Persians, forming the Delian League, 
and by Athens in 478. Sparta, always suspicious of threats to her power, regarded this action as unnecessary at best, and arguing that the war was over since, in their eyes, the goal of the alliance was to kick Persia out of Greece, and so it had been done. Regardless, Athens began to take prominent command of the League over the next few decades, despite some minor hiccups and internal rebellions. Tensions between growing Athenian Delian power and other city-states like Sparta soon broke out into war in 460, known as the First Peloponnesian War. Fighting continued until 485, whereupon a treaty known as the Thirty-Year Peace was issued to keep each side in their own spheres of influence, forming an effectively mm, primitive Cold War. The Delian League, now virtually consolidated into an Athenian empire, began to expand and generate vast wealth. Under the guiding hand of the Athenian politician Pericles, Athens entered into a golden age of prosperity. The growth of Athens frightened Sparta, and along with other disgruntled subordinate city-states, they declared war in 431, turning the 30-year peace into a 14-year one, and ignited the more famous Second Peloponnesian War. Over the next 27 years, the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians remained at a near standstill. Famine, constant raiding, costly and failed expeditions to permanently dislodge one side wreaked havoc across Greece, culminating in the surrender of Athens and the dissolution of the Delian League in 404 BC. With Athens' submission, Sparta enjoyed a relative hegemony over Greece, if only for a few short years. Further tensions between the other city-states, such as Thebes, Corinth, Argos, and Athens herself, with Spartan dominance, caused the Corinthian War to erupt in 395, lasting until about 387 with no apparent victor to speak of. Thebes, suffering numerous grievances against her by Spartan leadership, incited rebellion from 378 to 372 BC, and although a peace treaty had been signed, Sparta remained angry at the dissension and attempted to invade Theban territory in 371. To the astonishment of the Greek world, however, the Thebans actually managed to utterly crush the famous Spartan imagery in 371 at the Battle of Leuctra, effectively ending Spartan hegemony and ushering in Thebes as the premier power of the peninsula. For what seems to be the up time, the other city-states were displeased with Theban dominance, and a coalition of states like Sparta and Athens attempted to dislodge the Theban hegemony in 362 culminating in the Battle of Mantinea. In a twist of fate, the Thebans effectively won the battle in terms of troops killed, but their leadership was decimated, and Thebes later sued for peace. The Spartans and Athenians, on the other hand, suffered massive manpower losses, and were financially destitute from the decades of near-continuous conflict. But here is where we will leave off the narrative of Greece. While the political situation in Greece remained in near-constant turmoil, the blossoming of Greek culture which would come into a near worldwide dominance during the Hellenistic Age, continued to take place. The development of the philosophical tradition peaked with the three giants of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Playwrights such as Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Aristophanes pumped out dozens of works to captivate their audiences, even during times of war. These are the standard authors schoolchildren for centuries afterwards will come to study as part of a standard education, for those who could afford it. But the most influential author in the time of Alexander was absolutely the epic poet Homer, who was alleged to have composed the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad in particular would become marked importance to the Greeks, and especially to Alexander, who was alleged to have carried an annotated copy by Aristotle during his campaigns. The deeds and actions of the legendary heroes of the Trojan War would form a sort of a moral, in a loose sense of the word, guidebook on how men of, Gre of all ranks should act, from warriors to kings. This would heavily influence Alexander's actions and beliefs throughout his entire life. Despite the moment of relative tranquility following Mantinea, there remained an uneasy feeling that a shadow had been cast over Greek autonomy and freedom. With all sides weakened, there appeared to be no real contender for a Greek power to remain dominant over the peninsula. Worries remained that Persia, despite some internal struggles of their own, would attempt to invade again. Little did they know, however, that the real threat lay not in the east, but to the north, in a formerly pathetic minor kingdom of quasi-barbarians called Macedonia, where a young king named Philip II will unite his people, and, eventually, the people of Greece. <laughs>